Today we are going to continue our study on the first and second letter of uh, the Thessalonians. We started um, last week and we spoke about the background, how the church started, the events that led Timothy, Silas, or Silvanus, and, and Paul to cross from um, what today we call Turkey into Europe, went to Philippi, we know the story, what happened there, then uh, they ended up in Thessalonica, where um, they started this church. We have seen that what um, was happening was that Paul and his team were following the guidance, the, light, the um, guidance of the Holy Spirit, leading them to this particular time, to this particular place, this city, where God has planned to start a church. And um, it is interesting to um, realize that as Paul was, Paul's custom was, like Jesus' custom was, is that when he goes to a city, the first thing he does is try to find a flat in front of the sea view. No? No. That stops your rent. <laughs> he went and found what? Searched for what? Synagogue. He went, as it was his custom, to seek a place of worship. And the reason Paul and his team went there was because they wanted to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have seen from the book of Acts, from chapter 17, that he went with the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament. Remember, if you speak with a Jew, don't tell him Old Testament. That's as far as you can get. Speak about the word of God, the, the Lord, the Psalms or refer to it as the Tanakh, or you will have no chance to speak to him further. So when Paul went to the synagogue, he used the Old Testament, the structure and the teachings of the Tanakh to preach on Jesus Christ and why, the reason for Jesus had to die and rise again. And therefore, when we see this, we've seen this in the book of Acts, in chapter 17, his message was Christ-centered. His message was to show the Jews and the Gentiles that attended the synagogue that they needed to have Jesus in their life. They needed to believe in the Lord of Lords and in the King of Kings. What's also interesting is when Paul and Usually wrote his letters, he addressed it as if, as it is here, to the church. To the church. Now, for us, church, immediately we think of a building where people meet. Or we can even say church is the people meeting in a building. That's where um, our mind normally goes. However, the word church is made up of two words in the Greek, ek and kaleo, which is, meant they, together it comes ecclesia, which means called out ones. Which is now much more important for us to understand that the church, the church of the Thessalonians on God, 
was a church which was to be called out, a number of people called out from the normal kind of life to serve the living God. And when a ch church or a people is being called out, they are called out with a purpose. And as we read later on in this chapter, we find that Paul was convinced that they were called, were, were chosen because of the kind of lifestyle they were living. In their life, one could see repentance, a changed way, the changed way of thinking, not necessarily the sinful part, but their lifestyle changed in a way that everyone could see that these people belong to God. It is a church where Paul is really praising. He's boasting about them. And it is uh, also necessary to know, for those who were not with us in our Bible studies previously, that the Thessalonian church probably was the first church in history that is receiving an inspired letter. You heard me say this. Probably the Galatian letter was first. Scholars debate on that. But regardless, the Thessalonian church was privileged to receive, if not the first, the second inspired letter of the whole New Testament. Not even Mark, the first gospel, was written up to then. So these people, these people did not have the New Testament at their home. They did not have what we call the New Testament somewhere in a shelf or a church or in a car or on their mobile. They had nothing of this sort. And this makes it more great for this church because the few weeks that Paul stayed with them, Paul was able to teach this church nearly every single important doctrine of the New Testament. It's interesting also to notice, it's also interesting to take to heart, in fact, that these people were committed to follow Jesus. Their heart was so completely surrendered to him in the few weeks or months. We don't know how long that Paul stayed with them. The Bible says from Acts that he preached in the synagogue for three Shabbats. Probably after that he was kicked out. We don't know. We know that he managed to start his tent building business as well. So it must have been a little bit more than three weeks, in fact, to teach the uh, huge volume of doctrines that um, Paul has taught them. Nevertheless, what is for sure, what we can really say is that whatever they learned, they obeyed. Whatever they learned, they did. And besides that, they did not become just academically filled. They be have, have become evangelistic minded. Not only they preached in their little circle, they went even beyond their city. And Macedonia and Achaia heard the gospel and had a good rapport about this little church in Thessalonica. And this teaches us a lesson. What's our testimony? Because this church, I gave the title of this chapter, I can't say the whole book because I'm not teaching the whole book, so others will be teaching from it as well. At least in this chapter, what a church should be or what a church is. A church is a group of people called out. Kaleo, which is also another important word, 
because it made sense to the Jewish people and to those Gentiles who were in the synagogue learning the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And one example of this is in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7 from verse 6, and I'm going to read. And now it's, it will be good when we read these words, we try to connect them with the New Testament teachings. Not necessarily only in Thessalonians, like in First and Second Peter and so forth, but we find this concept scattered and repeated in the New Testament. For you are, okay, this is God or Moses speaking to the Jewish people, okay? In Sinai, they're not even in the land of Israel yet. They have not crossed to the promised land. For you are, already are now, present tense, a people holy to the Lord, your God. Now we can hear this echoing in the New Testament. Be holy, for I am holy. You are a holy priesthood. We find these words echoing in the New Testament. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. And the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than in any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, we all know that we use the story as an example, as an analogy, how Jesus freed us from the power of Satan, from the power of the devil. And therefore, we have seen, we have read, you are a chosen people. You have been called out. And this is something which you must also uh, discuss to understand the foundation of this letter. The foundation of the gospel. Remember when Paul went from Philippi to Thessalonica, he went to the synagogues to preach Jesus crucified. That's the message. It's a message of offense to many people for many reasons, especially those who lived in those years. If we uh, start touching what a the crucifixion really meant, not just the pain, but the shame which was so involved. It's for maybe for some another day. It was the most cruel way of one, of how one was killed because he, that person would be undressed from every kind of dignity that a person could have. But this is what Jesus went to preach. This is what, sorry, this is what Paul went to preach in the synagogue. Salvation starts, it begins with God. God the Father. Before the beginning of time started, trying to say something about eternity. I don't know how to explain eternity. Probably, I don't know if there is anyone who is able to explain eternity. But because of our brain is so little and so hard to make it understand, we use terminologies like before the beginning of time. The Bible uses these words, before the beginning of time. But somewhere in eternity, which we don't know where, what that is, God the Father knew about you, knew about me, and knew uh, the plan that he has for each one of us. Praise God. That's already on its own 
makes you an important person. Makes you valuable. Like he told the Jewish people, you are a treasure to me. You are the apple of my heart, my eyes. And that is what we are for God the Father. And that's what we are for God the Son, Jesus. Because although salvation starts and begins with God, it was the grace of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, that made it possible for God's plan, the Father's plan, to be fulfilled. When God, the Father, planned planet Earth and us in it, he also knew that mankind will spoil his plan. So God the Son, in eternity, somewhere there, he also made a plan to be the savior of the world. And this is what is happening. The grace of God, not because we deserve, not because we are in ourselves worthy of something, it is only by God's grace that he sees the words in us, what worth? The worth in Christ Jesus. And that is why it's important that not to know and to believe that there is not every religion can save us. Not the name of the church can save us. It is the baptism that we have in the name of Jesus, the person of Jesus, which we explained some weeks ago. Definitely not the baptism of water, but the baptism in Christ. That what really forgives our sins. The work of Christ on the cross, the fulfillment of God's plan for our salvation. Everything was paid. Those, that beautiful word that Jesus cried on the cross, tetelestai. It is paid for. Everything has been paid. Your sins have been paid for. That's where salvation took place in the mind of Christ. In the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. That's an individual bit. The work of the Holy Spirit for me was completed. That work of salvation was completed on the 21st of September, 1988, 7.15 in the afternoon. When I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That was the time when the Holy Spirit baptized me in the body of Christ. It is from that day that I was born again and he made me a new creation. That's where the process started. Although in God's eyes I was forgiven, on that day a process started that I will turn from my idols and start to serve the living God. This is the picture we see in the first chapter of Thessalonians. And as we study this book, we must see ourselves in it and ask ourselves questions such as, what kind of testimony do I have? What people say, about? can they see Christ? They can say, that man, that woman is different. And I'm sure that we live our Christian life, people will see that we are different. Now, people can become attracted towards us because they can trust us, because they can find it us, because they know, we, they know we are honest, they know we will not cheat, we will not backstab them, and so forth. Or else, our lifestyle will make them uncomfortable. Or both. But if they don't see any difference, they don't even know that we are born again by the Spirit of God, then we have to ask ourselves questions. And as someone else said this morning, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be, hey, I'm a born again Christian. Look, I have it on my T-shirt. Because they need to see Christ 
in your lifestyle, in the kinds and choice of words, your uncompromising commitment not to have anything to do with what is wrong, with what is evil. This is what we must learn from the book of Thessalonians. In fact, when we read verse 3, we find their work of faith, their work of love, and their hope. We can compare that verse with the last two verses of the chapter. Their work of faith, their obedience, they turned away from their idols. Now, we know that the Thessalonians worship the gracious um, gods and Roman gods, but we know that that's not the only gods that exist. There are gods that rule our heart. All those things that <laughs> turn our hearts away from obeying Jesus, from becoming Christ-like. Those are our gods. We need to turn away from them. Remember, as we heard in the introduction, we are a new creation. The old is gone. Right now, it's gone. It's gone. We can't keep picking up the old life. That's a stumbling block for us. We need to focus on Jesus and be who Jesus wants us to be. As I said earlier, in eternity, 